Hey, everybody. Welcome to the, I don't know what number, annual monthly um, privacy uh, book club. Um, delighted to uh, have uh, so many of you join us uh, today. Um, really delighted that um, so many people selected uh, Professor Ruha Benjamin's book, Race Against Race After Technology, um, a number of months ago. Um, who knew that we'd all be uh, thinking a lot harder about these issues now, given the um, uh, uproar and, and awareness that seems to have uh, uh, sprung out across the country. Um, uh, so I think for a lot of our audience, people who are focused on tech and data, um, this is more than just the interesting intellectual, let's make sure we're hearing and thinking what the leaders you know, in this debate are, are thinking. I know that lots of you are. Um, uh, now actually doing a bit more to see how you can apply some of the, the thinking about these issues to your actual work. So really delighted to uh, have you all with us. Um, Rachel uh, is going to um, introduce um, Professor uh, Benjamin. She'll give us a couple of um, uh, minutes of remarks. Um, we've got a couple of questions from her, uh, but then we will turn to um, uh, many of you. Uh, and so feel free to be uh, raising your hand and, and we'll obviously bring you in on, on video. Uh, when uh, when we call on you. So uh, Rachel is um, the lead of the FPF health um, policy work uh, and uh, joined us uh, not that long ago, one of our newer members and has been an incredible addition to the team. And Rachel, let me hand off to you to introduce Dr. Benjamin. Absolutely. Well, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Benjamin um, and note her remarkable work um, uh, on issues around data and race and technology. Uh, Dr. Benjamin is an associate professor uh, of African American studies at Princeton University, and her studies focus on the social dimensions of science, technology, and medicine. She founded the Just Data Lab, which unites activists, artists, educators, and researchers aiming to formulate a humanistic approach to data conception, production, and circulation. Along with authoring the book we'll discuss today, Race After Technology, she published People's Science, published in People's Science and contributed as editor of Captivating Technology. Dr. Benjamin investigates the relationship between innovation and, and, and equity, health and justice, and knowledge and power. And she has received numerous awards and fellowships, including those from the American Council of Learned Societies, National Science Foundation, Institute for Advanced Study, and also the 2017 President's Award for Distinguished Teaching at Princeton University. So it is, again, my pleasure to welcome the remarkable Ruha Benjamin. Uh, thank you for joining us and for making yourself available to talk about your work with us today. It is certainly our pleasure. And thank with, you. yeah, that being said, uh, well. Thank you. Thanks so much, Rachel, Jules, everyone at Future of Privacy Forum for inviting me today, for everyone who took time out of all the things you could have read and engaged, I really feel um, appreciative and honored that you focused a bit of your time on race after technology. I thought I would begin by offering um, some broader reflections on the multiple social crises we're facing at this moment and then briefly connect that to the focus of the book club before we move into some discussion. Um, I'll begin with a recent essay by one of my favorite writers and thinkers, um, Arundhati Roy, in a recent essay titled The Pandemic as a Portal. And she writes, historically, pandemics have forced humans to break with the past and imagine their world anew. This one is no different. It is a portal, a gateway between one world and the next. We can choose to walk through it, dragging the carcasses of our prejudice and hatred, our avarice, our data banks and dead ideas, our dead rivers and smoky skies behind us. Or we can walk through lightly with the little luggage, ready to imagine our world anew and ready to fight for it. This image in particular of dragging the carcasses of our prejudice and hatred, our avarice, our data banks, and dead ideas has been sitting with me 
because we can, as if we continue business as usual, we're almost certainly going to drag outmoded ways of thinking and doing things with us. When what we desperately need are tools to imagine and craft a world that is more livable, more just and joyful for all of the, the planet's inhabitants. To do this, though, I think we have to reckon honestly with what we've actually been holding on to so that we can even begin to consider letting it go. Otherwise, what's sure to happen is that many dead ideas will be repackaged as new and innovative tech solutions for the problems we face. And we're already seeing that both in the context of the pandemic and the policing crisis. So speaking of tech solutions, a couple of weeks ago, I was watching The Great Hack, which if you haven't seen it yet, it's a documentary on Netflix, please definitely, that's your homework for, for today. There's this moment when the narrator is explaining the goal of those who use fake news to manipulate the electorate on both sides of the Atlantic, one during the 2016 election in the United States, the Brexit referendum in the UK, the aim of these digital disinformation architects is explicitly <laughs> to break society. According to Steve Bannon, for example, it's only when you break it that you can remodel the pieces into your vision of a new society. Their new vision, of course, is nothing new. It's just more white supremacy, more class warfare, more patriarchy, more imperialism. But to get more, they need to break or continue to break the social contract by deepening divisions and amplifying hierarchies using what my colleague, colleagues call anti-social media. The point being there are powerful people and organizations working overtime to undermine the very premise of this thing that we take for granted called society, utilizing the very tools of AI and machine learning to further fracture and stratify the body politic. So how, how then should we think about our work in a context when there's a deliberate campaign to break the social? For starters, I think it means thinking about our various lines of work beyond a set, specific set of skills or credentials. I think it entails a keen understanding that many of the policies and structures that govern our lives are working against the social pushing a corrosive individualism cloaked in the language of freedom. This was true before the pandemic and has only intensified since. In our various lines of work, we can and should resist the corrosive individualism that infects every area of our lives. More broadly, we should challenge the distortion of freedom talk, which is really just the freedom to go to work without sick leave, the freedom to nurse the ailing without protective equipment, the freedom to grow the nation's food with the looming threat of ice raids, the freedom to be warehoused in prisons with no way to socially distance, the freedom not to care as the most vulnerable die off. This aim, the aim of this strain of freedom, a freedom from mutual obligation, is to break society, to erode mutuality, to grind down our ability to care for one another, to eat away at this notion of collective good, and to destroy the institutions upon which our society depends. So what does all this have to do with race and technology? Well, there are three implications I'd like to suggest, three kind of take home points that I hope people get from reading the book. First is that racism is productive. And by saying that, I'm not saying in the normative sense that racism is good, but in the literal capacity of racism to produce things of value to some, even as it wreaks havoc on others. We're many of us still taught to think of racism as an aberration a glitch, an accident, an isolated incident, a bad apple in the backwoods and outdated, rather than as innovative, systemic, diffuse, an attached incident, the entire orchard, in the ivory tower, in the tech industry, forward-looking, productive, even viral. 
In my field of sociology, we like to say race is socially constructed, but we often fail to state the corollary that racism constructs. Secondly, I really want us to think about the way that race and technology shape one another, because more and more people are accustomed to thinking about the ethical and social impacts of technology, but that's only half of the story. Social norms, values, structures all exist prior to any given tech development. So it's not only the impact of technology we need to be concerned about, but the social inputs that make some inventions appear inevitable and desirable, which leads to a final provocation, that imagination is a contested field of action, not an ephemeral afterthought that we have the luxury to dismiss or romanticize, but a resource, a battleground, an input and output of technology and social order. In fact, we should acknowledge that many people are forced to live inside someone else's imagination. And one of the things we have to come to grips with is how the nightmares that many people are forced to endure are the underside of elite fantasies about efficiency, profit, safety, and social control. Racism, among other axes of domination, helps to produce this fragmented imagination where we have misery for some, monopoly for others. This means that for those of us who want to construct a different social reality, one that's grounded in justice and joy, we can't only critique the underside, that is who is harmed by the systems, but also who benefits. We have to wrestle with the deep investments, the desires even for social domination. So, Finally, a word on privacy. Where does all this fit in terms of privacy rights and policies? I encourage everyone to check out the work of my colleague, legal scholar and anthropologist, Kiara Bridges. In her latest book titled, The Poverty of Privacy Rights, she makes a simple but controversial argument. Poor mothers in America have been deprived of the right to privacy. And while she contends that, of course, privacy has individual and social value, privacy can also act as, quote, a cover that prevents sunlight from disinfecting, the shield that permits crimes to go undetected, the barrier that obstruct, obstructs um, help from reaching the helpless. In short, privacy is not a straightforward good. Connecting that to our conversation about technology and privacy, one of the things I think we have to keep in mind is how the concerns of elites typically drive when and how privacy is addressed. Think tinted windows, private garages, encryption even, where the focus is on building legal and technological barriers to preserve privacy. As Kate Crawford at AI Now puts it, Elite conceptions of privacy haven't dealt with the mass issues that we're having with the way that our electronic communications are being intercepted, for example. So that we need a far broader change, in her words, to shift the frame away from a privacy in its 20th century formulation to consider the full implications of who is most harmed by these kinds of tracking technologies and to ask what collective frameworks of responsibility, accountability, and care do we need to address the democratic implications of these technologies if privacy is not enough? So with that, I'm going to pause and turn it over to my interlocutors. Thanks so much for those remarks. And I know the group here uh, has a number of questions, so I'm going to get out of the way. But I, of course, can't resist a minor comment uh, before I get out of the way. Um, you talked a bit about privacy sometimes being a shield um, uh, for uh, lack of visibility into data that might expose 
injustice or unequal treatment. And we do a lot of work around student data and student privacy. And the most vocal voices in this debate have often been um, relatively affluent um, people who, you know, why can't you just get parents to opt in and don't want to hear that for a lot of schools, parents being engaged isn't a given and actually spending the time, maybe they're not present or maybe they're not engaged. Um, and so you're just depriving those students of something that all the other students are going to reasonably, you know, choose. But if you're on the privacy side, you seem like you're, you know, saying that parents don't get to choose. Um, and one of the challenges has been elevating the voices um, of the communities that have a much more nuanced view um, of what's actually ethical at the end of the day to be done. Um, isn't this, um, but very often the, those communities are not being heard because they're not being heard you know, in any way. And this esoteric issue, which is critically important, you know, isn't the first one on their uh, agenda. Um, you know, so obviously there are groups paying better attention and so forth, but um, I wonder your thoughts on, um, and again, you, you don't even want to be, if you're in our position, going to those groups and saying, hey, will you speak up and sign on to our agenda because I think it helps you. That, that feels a bit, you know, like you're trying to use. Uh, yeah. So what, what are the kinds of strategies you know, that one might do to diversify the set of voices yeah. into who uses data and how. Yeah, I, th I think it's great to start with that example for a number of reasons. One, um, usually in, in longer talks, I, I describe a case um, taking us to St. Paul, uh, Minnesota of all, of all places right now, in which a few years ago, um, the public schools there created along with the police department what they called the innovation project which was this data collection project that was meant to kind of predict and label at-risk youth in the city and what happened was a number of social justice organizations some of which already had their eye on kind of digital justice issues and some that were folded into the process um, responded immediately, held a number of focus groups over a course of a year, sort of galvanized in part because they were already thinking critically about data justice issues. And first of all, they got a stop to that particular innovation project after about a year. And just in the last couple of weeks with the uprising in Minneapolis, um, their groundwork for the last several years has led to the severing of the relationship completely between the public schools and the police department. And so that's not a direct reply, but it is to say that there are oftentimes community organizations that are already thinking. In many locales that I go to and, and speak to people, um, it doesn't take much effort to find organizations that already have their eyes on these, but it's interesting, they may not frame it exactly the way that we are framing it in this conversation. It may not be framed as, a privacy issue for the youth. <laughs> it's often framed in terms of justice, in terms of the porousness between what schools and the carceral system. And so there is a, a, a I think, a deeply honed skepticism <laughs> that already, you know, as you as you rightly call, the kind of more nuanced understanding of what just collecting data or surveilling actually means for people on the ground. And so, for anyone interested, I think what is important is to develop those relationships with organizers, activists, organizations that are thinking about and working on these issues. And a starting point, a kind of umbrella organization that I can point people to is Data for Black Lives, because they in fact provided some of the consulting to the organizations in St. Paul that, that got a stop to the innovation project and, and on and on. So I think you know at the heart of it, it's building these relationships and also understanding the limits of our own framing, our own buzzwords that sort of become heuristics for a whole set of concerns that if when we only talk about it in those terms don't resonate, um, you know, with in, in, in many places. And so I'm glad we started with that one because it's it brings us to a concrete win. 
in the last few weeks that has, has grew out of a data justice movement in, in St. Paul. Super. Well, let me turn to some of you, um, Michael, Rachel, Brenda, whoever's ready to jump in. I'll jump in here. Um, Ruha, first off, it's a, certainly a pleasure to hear you talk about all of these issues and a lot of the um, comments you've made um, here and also in your book um, resonate uh, in the health space in, in many regards. Um, so I, I have uh, one question um, for you, uh, particularly as it uh, relates to what you touched on in terms of um, structural racism being um, a sort of resource uh, in some ways, mm -hmm. or in most ways, I think, mm -hmm. in the United States. Um, so structural racism, uh, as you mentioned, it's, it's uh, both empowered and shaped the American economy in many ways, really for the last 400 years. Um, and uh, there are many groups today with business interests in upholding that uh, particular structure or racial hierarchy, um, but in more modernized ways like the for-profit prison system, for example, local law enforcement, reaching ticketing quotas by over-policing uh, communities of color and so forth. We really saw that in New York City recently um, with the coronavirus where some were complaining about uh, individuals in Manhattan um, being um, uh, asked to put on their mask where uh, communities of color were being um, uh, or faced uh, punitive measures. Um, so that dichotomy there was very glaring. Um, so how might intentional data collection in use like um, auditing as uh, you mentioned in your book um, or even digital contact tracing as an example, how can those strategies, those data uh, collection and um, assessment strategies be used to bring balance and justice to issues like that. Um, and what do you see as, you know, possible pushback to uh, initiatives that want to bring justice to these issues, given that there is a business interest or business case for um, structural uh, racism or uh, racial uh, hierarchies and, and so forth, that, mm -hmm. that, that sort of caste system um, mm -hmm. that we see in place at a racial level. Yeah, so those are two heavy questions. I'll tackle the first one, and then you might, by the time I finish, have to remind me what the second one is, because sure. my brain is, uh, the coffee's wearing out. <laughs> um, in terms of the first, um, so let's see. what. In fact, I've already forgotten the first one, but I had a response to it. It just no, gave me the- Yeah, so how much- Yeah, yeah, got it, got it, yeah. Okay. Data collection to yeah. bring balance. Yeah, so the one of the most um, exciting and um, productive uses of data collection, AI, machine learning, that I sort of can get behind is when it's pointed in the direction of those who monopolize and wield power those who produce risk, not those who are labeled risky. So it has to do with not even only the actual development of the tool, but the starting question that's animating the entire technology, that's animating the entire research enterprise. So that rather, for example, than use a risk assessment tool to decide which um, person should get paroled and for how long that is pointed in the, in the direction of the, those labeled risky, we turn it back onto the courts themselves, onto the judges themselves. So there's a project out of um, MIT in which the researchers presented earlier this year at a conference, basically predicting the likelihood of judges to make uh, deci their decisions being unconstitutional based on their previous recorded decisions. And so it uses the data from judges' decisions to point the direction at those who are producing the risk. Likewise, there's a parity project that I often talk about called the white collar early warning system. That's about predis predicting the, the, the likelihood of people being a white collar criminal, you know? And so you can look that up. But then there's one that's I think especially relevant now when we're dealing with the pandemic, we're dealing with people about to or already having lost their homes, apartments, being evicted, something called the Anti-Eviction Mapping Project that again points the direction at landlords and looks at the landlord's likelihood to evict and, and engage in a whole host of um, really risk-producing behaviors. And so this is again a digital mapping 
project that everyone can look up. But if the, the common theme is that the data collection, the direction of the analysis, the predictions even are pointed at those in positions of power. Now, that I think has a direct implication for the second part in terms of capitalizing because the very same people who have the resources and the capital to produce many of the tools that we have to live with are those who will never allow the, 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 the lens to be pointed at them. They have a, a built-in incentive to keep the lens pointed at the most vulnerable, whether it's to decide who to you know, lend money to, business loan, home loan, education, all the rest. And so this is why it's insufficient to talk about simply the ethics of these technologies rather than not, and without talking about the power dynamics that uphold even what questions are allowed to be asked. Even the idea that we could even say, let's look at you know, how likely you know, police officers are to abuse <laughs> rather than look at you know, the people who are being abused. And so there's a lot more that I could say, but uh, ultimately it's about thinking about where our lens is pointed, who we're collecting data on, and where the incentive structure allows us even to ask in terms of our intellectual freedom to be able to ask certain questions. So I have a question that I think sort of builds on that or follows up from that, which is, um, I, I sort of had it already ready, but it's about the opportunities sort of which you addressed in your comments that the pandemic gives us and even separate from the pandemic, that's sort of a, a circumstantial, you know, context that we're in. But in light of the uh, Black Lives Matter police brutality, unfund the police mm -hmm. discussion that's going on right now um, is a way to, to sort of take advantage of this as an opportunity to do what you just said, which is to sort of flip things around mm -hmm. in the focus, in this case, literal focus of the example I'm going to give, Mm -hmm. uh, uh, like facial recognition technology and things like that. So one of the things that we've had discussions about is like, what if we put all of the police in a facial recognition database? Like what if they were also mm -hmm. subject to the same sort of tracking and scrutiny and observation? And it's entirely different than body cams because it, body cams are mm -hmm. still protecting them, like their expression and everything is not on there and, and it's mm -hmm. focused out. But this, this flips that, um, you know, that narrative mm -hmm. and that focus onto them. Um, just curious as to, you know, this whole concept of maybe we are going to get the opportunity to entirely rethink policing. Yeah. Partly because of policing has become so much more uh, yeah. visual. We're aware of the things that are happening in a way yes. that we weren't. And it's happening in this pandemic where we have this social upheaval happening and maybe we have the way to, to sort of take advantage of that. Yeah. Um, yeah. That's an interesting um, thought experiment. <laughs> like, how would it change? Would it change any of the dynamics? And I, I, in the same way that body cams have not presented a solution, I am also wary of even thinking that putting the faces of the police, simply putting the faces of the police in the training data or in the, in the database would dramatically upset the status quo, in part because the larger ecosystem hasn't changed in terms of the police being an agent of the state. And having, you know, and then who has control over that data? So even with body cam data, who can turn off and on the camera? Who can scrub the, scrub the data set, you know, at will? Certainly not your everyday person, but the people behind the scene. And so right now, I think exactly going to the broader point of your, your question, I think we have to be very vigilant about how the calls for defunding the police um, may focus too narrowly on the literal police mm -hmm. and not enough on policing as a logic and a practice that exceeds that one institution and that penetrates every area of our lives. The, the forms of policing in our educational system, in our healthcare system, in our financial system. And so it could very likely be that we may have fewer officers and yet the logics mediated by technology, facilitated by technology, the logics of policing penetrate even more um, intimately into our everyday lives. And so I think right now, this is the perfect time to, to clarify what exactly is the sickness? What exactly is wrong? Is it only the 
flesh and blood police officers who shoot at us and beat us? Or is it even broader, the, 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 the imagination in which they operate that actually exceeds that one institution? Because what will happen and what is already being proposed are different apps to help with police brutality. Um, let's, instead of having police who can shoot you, let's have a so-called neutral system to decide who is actually a threat, et cetera. And so this is that crossroads when we either take, we allow tech fixes to drive the, the, the changes and, and assume that, okay, if it's not this literal thing, then this is gonna be a better option, or we think much more fundamentally about what is at stake and what needs to transform, which is not just getting rid of one institution, but about actually purging ourselves of this punishment imagination that really it shapes, especially for those um, on the underside of modernity, has, have lived with the car carceral sort of underpinnings in almost every other institution. And that's why I encourage people to look at Kiara Bridges' work on the poverty of privacy rights because the, the, the breach of privacy that many people are for the first time ex realizing in the context of our platforms and so on, that has been, you know, for poor women, especially, you know, her focus is poor pregnant women, but poor people in general have never had a right to privacy <laughs> in terms of ac accessing basic benefits. And so again, learning from that, and understanding that what may be new for us now in terms of um, a challenge is something that many communities have, have lived with. Um, right. And so I think that it's important that that question and also understanding that this is a crossroads where the demand for change may re-entrench certain dynamics facilitated by technology and technologists who think they have the answers. Let me bring in Michael McCullough, who's uh, one of the country's senior, thoughtful chief privacy officers. Nobody's here wearing any particular title other than interested uh, reader, but Michael has certainly seen a lot of these issues from every side. So welcome his reaction to the book or, or uh, uh, reaction to Ruha's comments. Uh, thanks for having me, Jules. Uh, Professor Benjamin, uh, I couldn't be happier to have a chance to talk with you. Um, I'll be honest, this is deeply, deeply challenging for me. Um, one of the things that help, oh, half of the things in here were triggering and I had to take a step back, get some water and come back to it. Because even this conversation, when you talk about code switching, uh, one of the things I thought about towards the end of your book, when you're talking about code switching, um, we're kind of getting more space for people to, for example, bring themselves to work, but there's still a certain amount of code switching going on. And I know that because as I'm reading through how you're, you're, you know, the, how you're describing experiences, various experiences, and how I've experienced them, I get angry. And I want to fix them, and I want to solve them. And I can't go into work angry. And I'm expected to be composed and have bearing. Mm. And I do. I'm a Marine. I have been in situations where if you don't have composure, you don't have bearing, it could cost people's lives. But this is different. So, I mean, the book is amazing. I mean, you have gang babies, racist soap dispensers, Shirley cards, <laughs> promise where I can I currently invest in. Um, but I left it kind of wondering what, what's next. Mm -hmm. I, I didn't see if there's a, so, a social contract that's been broken, mm -hmm. we're breaking it every day. Yeah. I, I'm curious, because usually the solve for that is, is in legislation. Mm -hmm. And I think part of the problem we've had in privacy and legislating privacy, besides some of the you know, specific interests that one group has over another group, for example, do I support the plaintiff's bar or am I generally not supportive of the plaintiff's bar? Mm -hmm. Putting that aside, generally when there's societal harms, we can identify them and we can address them through mm -hmm. legislation, through statute. And mm -hmm. as I read through all of this, I'm like, yeah, I know this is painful. This is existentially painful for me to read. And I know that it's wrong, but I can't specify what the harms are, mm -hmm. especially when you're talking about some of the harms being the result of extreme personalization. So it kind of masks the fact to your point that there's a whole industry mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> around data and its processing to get to that result. Yeah. And that's not something that you know, legislation is very good at, at, at fixing. So yeah. I'm curious what your thought is on, on terms of A, yeah. being more specific about the harms. And by the way, FPF mm -hmm. in terms of privacy has done an amazing job mm -hmm. of kind of elucidating harms. Awesome. From misuse of data, but what's your what's your suggestion? What's your yeah, suggestion? my my. So again, like I'm a sociologist, and um, and so I am going to focus 
largely on the harms that are produced through our social norms, our social structures, our cultural um, practices, and understanding that certainly laws and policies have contributed and the lack of certain laws and policies have contributed to many of the problems that I'm raising in race after technology. But my general sort of a, a thinking around this is that the problems are produced both through these top down mechanisms, but many bottom up mechanisms, many ways in which we perpetuate the same logics and practices. And so even often when I talk about policing, I want to focus on the way that everyday people police one another through, for example, apps like Citizen and Nextdoor and all the rest. And so there's a lot, a lot of great work that focuses on the big actors, the institutional actors, the official mechanisms. I'm really interested in how each one of us in our everyday lives also reinforces and perpetuates certain forms of, let's just say, policing in one instance, but all of the other harms, which means to me, if we are contributing to the problem, which we are, that means that every single one of us, all of those mechanisms contributing to the problem are also possible ways to begin to undo, to think about the logics, the way that we do things in our own lives, the technologies that we adopt and, and spread and, and, and recommend, for example, um, and how those becomes areas of change. And so the change is not only kind of like the collective change, the official change, but it's also thinking about how we're perpetuating certain sy systems in our everyday decisions. That's what culture is. Culture is the, 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 the you know, the, what's in the fishbowl we don't even realize, like the water. <laughs> and so once we begin to take note of that, then we can think about, okay, how am I, how, how you know, in my own workplace, in my own relationships, what forms of surveillance do I, for example, adopt and think of as protecting me that's part of a wider kind of surveillance net? And that's just you know, one example. And so I think the take home that I would love people to think about is how as many areas that produce the problems that we're grappling with, those are all sites of counter narrative, counter action that we can begin to undo. And some of that can happen individually and, and a lot of it happens um, collectively, you know, through the kind of digital justice organizations I mentioned, getting involved in those. Um, um, but again, the point is that lots of great work, I'm glad happening at the official kind of policy law realm, but let's also think about how it permeates so many other areas. And so that's what I'm kind of trying to get us to move towards in both the way I frame the problems and then what we do about it. I just, just a quick follow-up. Mm -hmm. I mean, are, are you suggesting in some ways removing the utility or the, the productive nature of racism from these things that we're interacting with? Uh, I'm not sure. So I think what, what, how that relates to that particular issue is to, uh, to think about how we ourselves may be benefiting from racism. <laughs> Right, so we often look for the big bad boogeyman, the men in robes, the you know the, the the straightforward racism. So part of it is to think about how have I or people that I love or people in my networks or my workplace benefiting from a racist systems, rather than just look to where we the harm may be happening. It's to also look at how things are set up. And for one example, one example, someone just tweeted, I think yesterday, a friend, a colleague of mine in Brazil who's been working on issues of race and credit scoring in Brazil gave a talk and, and you know, was, there was a back and forth. And, and the way that he put it is very succinct. He said, if by changing this particular um, business, you know, model, <laughs> um, you will lose profit, you know, by addressing this, this bias aspects of your business model, that means up to now you have been profiting off of that bias, right? It was a way of thinking about it that, yes, you are, so you're worried about losing profit by addressing this particular bias, but that means that you're capitalizing on it, right? And so I think part of what I want us to do is think about it in those terms, which in part requires that we become accustomed to understanding that we're all in this, we're all, we're all in this, this racist system together, that the, there's not just the racist in the red hat that we need to, that binary, the bad guys out there, it's that 
in our everyday workaday business, the, the things that are incentivized, the things that we are, you know, we are promoted on <laughs> and all of the rest are also infected with the, you know, the, the, the harms that we want to tackle. So let me share something. I'm looking at the people on the call. Uh, there are about a hundred or so and, and a good number are at organizations where marketing is a big part of, of what they do. They sell products, they market, they advertise. And one thing that comes up to us often, which I think people struggle with, you know, so they understand that they really ought not to be doing marketing that is going to be uh, damaging, denying benefits, violating civil rights, hopefully, right? But they do market, they do have profiles, they do put people in categories, whatever they may be, urban, high-end, you name the, the bucket. And they say, well, at the end of the day, I'm just trying to sell stuff. All right, put the right ad in front of the right person. And obviously, in examples that, that you and others have pointed out, when that means you know not showing the good job to a certain audience because that's what the data says, mm -hmm. obviously people are missing an opportunity. But there's a whole bunch of others where it's not always easy to understand mm -hmm. when is it just good marketing because mm -hmm. you're gonna make more money mm -hmm. advertising more efficiently. Yeah. And it works because the people you're marketing to are more likely to buy, yeah. but you are putting people in buckets. And so yeah. people have renamed those buckets many, many, many years ago. I worked at DoubleClick. We bought a big data company and I said, let me see the categories. And some of them were really overtly ugly. Yeah. And so they've all been renamed now, right? Yeah. Nobody is called, you know, yeah. for this, uh, no one's called the redneck corner, but, yeah. but those buckets of, these people spend yeah. like this and they're the ones who buy the grill or they're the yeah. ones who buy the cheap product. How should people who are, you know, in charge of naming those categories, creating those categories, saying these can't exist, what, how, how does one draw a good line between yeah. marketing and, right? Marketing is discrimination. Yeah. It's, but it, when is it? Yeah, I got it. I got it. So for, I have two thoughts on that. Um, and I would also say um, marketing is not, there are sociologists and I'll put their info in the chat who specialize in this intersection of race and marketing who have much deeper, more nuanced insights. Um, I can speak to the kind of targeted marketing that I discussed in, in the book, but even there's a whole broader history and literature around this. And I'll definitely put that in the, in the chat. The two things is I like that you uh, pointed out the, the way that um, code words and euphemisms, you know, stand in for um, sort of older, more crude, um, you know, buckets. And so partly we have to, that's a first layer of insight and reckoning is the fact that it might not be, it might not sound like the kinds of discriminatory categories in our grandmother's generation, but we have to look under the hood. So then when we look under the hood of these categories, part of the next step is to have people around the table, one, who, under, who are going to be able to contribute what is the history of this category in terms of either being a benign sort of demographic category or a classification historically that has been used to stratify people and to, and to give uh, some people resources and not. And so distinguishing um, empirically based on the categories and the demographics that your particular organization or company are dealing with, which ones are, could be considered benign, but which ones have this much deeper history of being the category itself becomes a technology of stratification, becomes a way to create parallel universes right now. There's a lawsuit, I think, in D.C. of um, a housing developers that were using Facebook ads to, um, to uh, ensure that elderly people didn't see their ads. They didn't want older people to, um, you know, have, th that was a waste for them. They didn't want for a variety of reasons. And other categories, um, single mothers, um, people who speak Spanish, um, a whole host of things. And so it would be important for us to understand which of these have been tools of discrimination historically and now that are ensuring that resources and opportunities are going to some people. And I think the list is gonna be longer on the side of 
really harmful categories, unfortunately, more than the benign ones. But I think that's the second step is to understand, like, to have that social and historical literacy around the table, the disciplinary forms of knowledge. And then the, I think the hardest thing to really reckon with is how the business model, the incentive structure makes it that you can know one and two. You could understand how those code words are working. You could have that social and historical literacy, but it doesn't make financial sense to act on that knowledge. It doesn't, you know, you still go ahead and, and, and use those, those forms of targeted marketing. I think that is the stickiest point is where you actually are profiting off of withholding opportunities and benefits from historically dispossessed groups in our country. And that's where I think the major reckoning comes. And I don't have an easy answer for that. But I am going to point those on the call in the direction of one or two texts of people who have really written and have probably have much more pointed um, advice and feedback for you. Caitlin, did you want to jump in? Yeah. Um, so first off, I just want to say I really enjoyed the book. Um, it was fantastic. And it just really resonated with me. And something that I thought was really interesting was you include a, a really positive note about privacy by design. And I mean that literally in the fact that like you're looking at a privacy preserving clothing and things like that. And that was really interesting considering how many articles I've been reading about protesters doing things like wearing um, makeup that would distort their image for facial recognition, putting on COVID-19 masks that do the same. And I think these things are really important and wonderful ways to resist, but also law enforcement have cameras attached to their bodies. They have stationary cameras in the environment around us. Um, they have cameras on drones above us. So, you know, when we celebrate these means of resistance, are we just asking too much uh, of protesters or of everyday civilians? Yeah. Is celebrating these accomplishments another way to put the responsibility on the civilian instead of yeah. on the police? Yeah, I think I would, I would lean towards that as um, it, these kind of individual level forms of subversion can never stand in for a, a broader ecosystem of accountability that places it on the shoulders and the responsibility of um, the major institutions, of governments, of you know, companies to actually make it so that people don't have to constantly be so vigilant, <laughs> you know, like we have to live our lives constantly trying to, um, you know, and read every, you know, all the kind of consent forms. And it's just like so much of our life force is going to be put into <laughs> trying to avoid unwanted detection and surveillance. And that is not, I don't think, um, a sort, not, no, it's not practical, but it's not ethical either. And so, I think why I like pointing to these is because it signals people's awareness and desire for subversion more broadly. And so it, it becomes a kind of stepping stone to thinking about more collective and institutionalized forms of responsibility. So it, it, it points to the demand from below that we don't want these things. <laughs> and so, and here are the creative ways that we're gonna express our refusal and our dislike. But I certainly agree with you that it should never stand in for or be romanticized as a replacement for um, a wider a wider reckoning. So thank you for pointing that out. Alex Joel, longtime friend and privacy and security and surveillance uh, expert. Um, Alex, go ahead. Yeah, thank you. This has been fascinating. Hello, Professor Benjamin. I have not read your book, but I will certainly I have it. I have it bookmarked. I'm going to get it. That's good. Um, at the very start of your talk, you said that we should avoid um, pursuing technology options which have already been tried, maybe in a different guise, and have been discredited. And I was wondering whether you could give a couple of examples of that, because for those of us in the technology policy and law area, and we want to do something positive, mm -hmm. and so we naturally gravitate toward techno technological solutions. My own mm -hmm. bias is that we need to marry technology with something mm -hmm. else and can't look at just technology on its own, like an app will solve everything. Mm -hmm. But I was wondering if you could give a couple of examples of things yeah. you've seen that have struck you that way. Yeah, could you, could you just remind me, because I'm, I'm sort of missing the context that I said that in. Do you, can you just say again what you heard? So I can recall. <laughs> I may have misheard, but I thought yeah. what you were saying was um, 
when we're thinking of how to respond to the current situation, mm -hmm. you've already heard of a couple of oh, proposals yes. for technology solutions, which yes. seem to be, which, which are repeating yes. what mistakes that have been done in the past. And, yes. and maybe people putting those forward do not realize the full context of what they're suggesting. Yeah, exactly. So now I know it, it was in the, towards the beginning of when we started the q and I mentioned this. And so right at the very start of, of chapter five of, um, of the book, I compare two apps that both market themselves as decarceration apps. And so now I think this is gonna become even more um, relevant as people scramble for alternatives to policing. And so these two apps, one is called Promise and it was a, a kind of venture capital, um, you know, came out of some venture capital funding and Jay-Z was behind it. And it was, uh, you know, a, a, a one of these things that would allow people not to be held in a cage, but it would surveil them and provide a powerful mechanism to if they violated any of the technical aspects of the app, a powerful mechanism to get them rearrested. All right. And so it was billed as a solution, but actually created a, a, a newfangled way to surveil and, and recage people compared to an app called Appolition, which, which is a riff off of Abolition, which is like an endowment for bail fund in which all of us could download the app and our spare change would go towards a, a rotating bail fund that community organizations use to bail people out and then the funds go back into. And so I'm comparing these because on the surface they seem like they're the same. They're two apps, they're in the de decarceration area, you know, um, but then when you look at the, the wider ecosystem in which they grew out of and what they will contribute to, they take us to, through to very different wormholes. <laughs> One that's enfolded in a particular um, a model that basically is promising. Again, it's called Promise. Promise is a cheaper way to keep track of risky people and a mechanism to lock them back up, right? And it promises to save the city money because you're not holding people in jail, et cetera. So all of the logics and incentives and marketing when you dig into it is really not to benefit a population of people who are over-policed <laughs> and profiled on an ongoing basis. Whereas the ethos behind abolition and also the ecosystem, the fact that community organizations are the ones accessing the funds and that it's not, those funds are not actually in benefiting the carceral system, they're rotating. So again, I think what I'm calling for is not a, to be against all technology, but to really pay attention to the relations, the networks, the ecosystem that gives rise to it and that which in circulates. And so the case study of those two, I'm hoping can get people to think critically, not just about the technical details of the particular app or, or system, but what is this folded in? What is the wider context in which it's being developed? What is the animating force and ethos behind it? And so these, I think, present um, a, a good sort of comparison that can then be applied to other things that people are developing. Great, thank you very much. You're welcome. Alyssa, I think we have another question from the floor. Mark. Hi, thanks. Um, great book. Thank you very much, Dr. Benjamin. Um, compelling and uh, difficult to read and very enlightening to read at the same time. So uh, thank you. I uh, really, really like the way you started us off today with the term productivity. Um, again, changing the, in framing the situation completely different. Uh, for me, that uh, definitely resonates but it brought to bear the power of the words. And uh, one of the other panelists um, mentioned um, the idea of resistance. And I'm a little bit concerned of the power of the language of using resistance um, to surveillance versus promoting privacy. I was wondering, uh, based on your work, are you seeing that push versus pull or that pro versus con? Like, how does that play out a little bit more in your world? Thank yeah. you. Yeah, no, thank you. And I also, as someone who, you know, just appreciates precision when it com comes to language, I can appreciate that question. And I, I think I, my first pass at it is to think that these are two sides of the same coin. Um, uh, but 
one, you know, it, audience is important in terms of how we're framing things. And, you know, the, the idea of promoting privacy, in some ways it falls into a genre of um, frameworks that some of my, my, my colleagues have published a paper called Happy Talk that is about how when we talk about diversity and inclusion, we're in the corporate culture encouraged to draw on happy talk or more euphemistic or more good feeling framings in order to win sort of um, win over our audience. And so resisting surveillance in the context that Caitlin and I were describing was specifically in talking about the way that protesters on the ground are both experiencing and framing what they're doing, which is a very different context in a corporate context where your audience, you're trying to get them to win over, you know, this idea of privacy. And so I think understanding language, the terms that we use have to be both reflective of and tailored to the people that we're in conversation with. And so um, in general, my, own, my book and my own sort of, um, sort of pedagogical approach is to... Did we lose sound here? Oh, can you hear me? Nope. No, we're I've got okay. you. Okay, Jules, I think everyone else can hear. Yeah, <laughs> um, my, my own approach is to often articulate problems and frame them point of, from the point of view of those who are often not in the conversation, the people trying to subvert surveillance, people on the ground because the corporate speak, the official language that euphemizes often um, social problems is the, often the dominant framing. And so people often, when I, when I present sort of my work, I'm, I'm often, there's a, the pushback is, well, you didn't present two sides, you didn't present the other side of the problem. Can you, can you tell us the other view? And I was like, well, the other view is being marketed to you 24 seven. There are people working around the clock to ensure that you think about things in these terms. And so if I have your attention for an hour, or if I have your attention for the space of a book, I'm generally going to articulate um, the problem from the underbelly, <laughs> from those okay. who are most harmed. And so I hope that uh, clarifies in terms of my own personal de decisions and how to frame things and the language I use. No, it does. And uh, thank you, Caitlin, for bringing up that term, uh, because I think that as a privacy professional, we're we are happy talkers and we're talking about, you know, how we do all this privacy great stuff versus the other side of that, which is um, a resistance to the lack of privacy. Um, we're out there promoting something. And I think that the language is very, very important. And um, it makes me uncomfortable. I'm sure I would suspect it makes some other people uncomfortable mm -hmm. when you align yourself with their resistance and you're mm -hmm. in the institution. Mm -hmm. So um, I think it was a, a great uh, tie in from your introduction around productivity of mm -hmm. racism. And here's the <laughs> benefit of resistance. Those are just not usually combined together. So mm -hmm. thank you. No, Mark, I'm going to give you the last word. I promised uh, Professor Benjamin we'd keep her for a half an hour. Thanks for letting us keep you for an hour. As you can imagine, she's uh, in intense demand, A, because the book has been so well received, and B, because everybody really wants to hear from her now more than ever. Uh, I hope we'll have opportunities to continue to intersect sure. and uh, take advantage of building on your work and, and helping um, uh, 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 fan its impact. So Thanks to all of you. Thank you for the book. Thanks for everyone who bought it. If you didn't buy it, Thank please you. do buy it. Thanks, um, team, Michael, everybody who has joined us uh, today. Um, uh, I hope we're leaving you wanting more. Um, we'll share some of the links um, that uh, Professor Benjamin shared for further reading, and uh, let's continue down this line. Thanks, Thank everybody. Thank you all for having me. Take care. Have a great day. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Bye.